So let me start by just framing this conversation that we get to have with Tim. Um, because we're all telling each other that working together is really the only way that we're gonna get through this health crisis and that our relationships with family and friends and neighbors really are a great source of strength and hope. But we know that right now, four out of five Americans say that we have never been more divided than we are today. So at exactly the moment when we need each other the most, we find ourselves caught in these old habits of, of blaming, of othering people who don't share our views. And I'd like to take a quote from Tim's Unite website, from his call, which we're gonna hear more about, because he writes it beautifully. He says, our political divisions have become personal divisions. The more we hate each other, the more we isolated we become, the more friends we sacrifice, the more love we give up, the more hope we lose. So Tim is just the person we want to talk to right now. Uh, Tim is somebody who has spent his career focused on inclusion, on bridging divisions. I'll say a little more about him. He co-founded and currently chairs the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. CASEL is the abbreviation. And he is one of the leading educational reformers in the field of social and emotional learning. And he has for a long time headed the Special Olympics, which focuses on promoting health and education and a more unified world through the joy of sports. So Tim, again, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you um, tell me first, because this is so personal for all of us, What's this crisis been like for you? Do you have you had any personal surprises or revelations that have come out of it? Well, so first of all, thanks for the beautiful introduction and thanks for continuing, Bobby, carry on your work, which is both in the clinic and in the larger context of the culture. Uh, such you have such an important voice, I think, at this time, uh, maybe more important than it's ever been uh, to accentuate not just the the enormous popularity of things like TED Talks and things like that where we get people excited and get people intrigued, but now to really carry on sustained, serious, committed action you know, to follow the, the, the big ideas, to follow the power of relationships, the centrality of relationships. Uh, we, are, we are in a moment in which I dare say the future for all of us depends on whether we get this better. I don't wanna say right and wrong, but whether we get better. Yeah. Uh, and the, the issue really is in some ways tilting the, uh, the arc towards. It's not, it's not going from zero to 100 or saying we've been wrong, now we gotta be right. Our view is you just gotta get better. You just, we just gotta get better. You know, think of marriages, friendships, brothers, sisters, neighbors. There's no perfect relationship, but there are moments when the relationships got better. And those were the moments when you felt a hopefulness and a positivity and a, and a sense of trust and belonging. Someone comes home and says, you know, things are better at work. There's a, there's a birth in that, in that, in that experience of, of, of great uh, strength, I think. So this is a moment for us to get better, to look at this moment and say, when we're done, how can we be better? Not how can we fix things and improve Zoom. I mean, these are important things, of course, but but how do we get better with our relationships? And so, you know, I, I, I would just, you know, from a very personal point of view, uh, this crisis cost uh, two lives in my own family, not directly from health outcomes, but from, a, from an accident. And, um, you know, you can't blame it on anybody, just life. Uh, and I think this is true for so many of us, you know, uh, we're here one day and uh, we're scared to death that we're not gonna be here the next day or that someone we love isn't. And I think grief and the fear of loss um, is such a central uh, experience for all of us. And I think it's one we avoid because it's such a deeply a painful part of a relationship saying goodbye, uh, even when you didn't plan on it, even when you couldn't to someone you loved. Uh, and so the, 
you know, part of relationships and part of this healing process right now is going to be taking uh, a real uh, honest approach to grief yeah. and becoming aware of our grief, not judging ourselves, not expecting quick solutions. Um, and then welcoming the joy and the love of others, you know, and at least for me, this has been, you know, I have several, I won't show you, but several little just cards, you know, some people just take a Hallmark card and, you know, sometimes you think, well, that was nice, but it's, but I'm telling you for me, this, at this moment, the emails I've gotten, it's about hundreds, just a few, but I look at them and I think to my, you know, my, my, the, the, the soft spots, spots in my heart are strengthened by the love of others. So I think, I, I'm sorry to end, start on a, on a, on a slightly more uh, painful note, but I, I, I hope in, in sharing that, I'm opening up others to be comfortable saying, yeah, we wanna be hopeful and optimistic and confident and these kinds of things, but, but there is, uh, there's a real, uh, there's loss. In, yeah. in moments like this, we've mo many, many, many people I know have, and, and in, in terribly sad ways, had to say goodbye to people that they couldn't even be there for them. I mean, so I think the yeah. first thing we got to recognize about the power of relationships is that they are the glue, the, in a sense, the way in which we're woven back into hope is when we lose hope uh, through loss, it is others who weave us back into it in a way that, uh, uh, sorry for that. Um, so that's been happening. I think the other, well, let me stop there because I've got three or four other thoughts, but maybe yeah. Bob, you can comment on that because it's maybe you've got a, a way of thinking about this. That's even more importantly, you know, more clear for folks. Well, actually, first I'd like to thank you for starting out with what happened for you personally and this idea of loss because mm -hmm. that it, that's what's real. And, and I think what we're finding now is that um, what can be so heartening and hopeful is when we share the truth of what's hard and yeah. the pain that we're all feeling. And so the fact that you just did that is makes it more real rather than all of us just talking about heroes and being strong. And that's all important too, yeah. but we're losing things. And, you know, I've been more impressed with this idea of uh, ambiguous loss. Some of the losses, there, there are, of course, the terrible losses of people who die. And, and then there are the losses of milestones, of, of graduations, of, you know, hoped for weddings, of, of yeah. so many. And we think of them as smaller, but they mean so much. And, yeah. and, and some of our older loved ones who are holding on for these times that, that they're not going not to be able to celebrate together. So there's so many ways in which I think when we can share what's really happening and not just the bright, shiny, hopeful part, um, it's more bonding, it's more relieving, and it, it makes us feel more together. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think, I think, you know, the, the, the thing that I also, uh, maybe this is common or maybe it's just my circle, but Talk to a few people who said, well, I was going to call your cousin, but I, I wasn't sure what to say. Or uh, I was going to write, but I didn't really have any words and I don't want to be in the way. And I think, you know, it's, you know, everybody's different, but I think there's also sort of a little bit of like, I don't want to sound like I'm sad because people aren't going to want to talk to me. And I don't want to sound like I'm struggling because then people are going to avoid me or I'm not, you know, I'm going to be at the dinner table and everybody's going to be like, Oh, what a, you know, what a downer he is or she is. Uh, I think we got to have a little more confidence in each other. You know, uh, we, we don't have to mourn with, with, uh, with a leaden sense of hopelessness to mourn with a desire to connect. And I just would say th this is one of the issues with, you know, we see this with disability. People have a child with a disability. And other people say, well, I didn't call because I didn't know what to say, you know, because right. I'm used to calling and saying, oh, congratulations, the baby's uh, healthy and everything. And, and this, this woman or this couple, their baby has Down syndrome. I said, well, why wouldn't you call and say congratulations? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I wasn't yeah. before, you know, and right at the beginning, right at that moment of birth, you start to see this device, it's not mm. a device you start to see this peeling away of people. Wait a minute, I'm not sure. And all of a sudden the fear of not knowing how to communicate becomes 
a discomfort with communication, the discomfort becomes distance. And all of a sudden, a child is 18 months or two or three, and that mom or dad have felt alone for three years. Yeah. yeah. Not because their child had Down syndrome, but because everybody was too afraid to connect with them, to love right. them through it, to support them, to congratulate them. I mean, the thing parents who have a child with intellectual disabilities almost rarely hear is congratulations. Right. Oh, yeah. And well, it's, it's, I only mention it because it's part of our culture. You know, when, yeah, when people say, I yeah. don't want to talk to that Republican or I don't want to talk to that tr Trump voter or that Democrat or that person. Well, we've grown so fearful of communication, of relationship, that we'd rather sacrifice the relationship than be open to a slightly maybe uncomfortable or unusual yeah. conversation. Yeah, yeah. Always a mistake, I think. Yeah. And I think what you're saying that, that often it comes from this place of fear of, I won't know what to say. And one of the things that we learn is that just asking somebody, well, so what's it like? Yeah. Uh, what are you thinking about now? Yeah. What's it, you know, just asking that uh, yeah. is enough often yeah. that we don't have to know what to say. Right. That's um, if we're just open and, and curious that people yeah. are usually willing to talk about their experience. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is why we're trying to marshal this big global effort this Friday uh, on May 1st for 24 hours with people all over the world. Simple call, call to unite. You say, well, yeah. what's that? What's that? It's really a call to relationship uh, in some ways. It's really a call to say, you know, in some ways this might sound a little catchy, but we've got two epidemics. We have an epidemic of disease and an epidemic of division. Mm. And as uh, a friend of mine said, uh, who's, a, who's a minister in a, in a local church said, you know, we're, we're all separated now, but we were separated before too. Mm. 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 Can Separation you say- didn't just start with this. So we have to pay attention to the fact that both epidemics have the same solution strengthening our relationships. You, we will not solve this scientifically without trusting and supporting each other. And we will not solve it culturally, politically, or emotionally without building better trust for each other. So our invitation on this call uh, to unite is to invite people from all over the world to teach their masterclass. Yeah. Teach the masterclass on what your strategy is. What skill do you know? What what strategy have you used to reach out to someone who's on the other side of any boundary in your life? It could be someone in your own mm. home, or it could be someone mm. of a different political party or a different skin color or religion or race or gender or sexual orientation. But the invitation is reach out. As you say, take the first step. You don't, we don't have to solve the problem, but take the first right. step. And everybody has that choice every day. You yeah. know, it's not like yeah. this is a problem only we can solve but it's also a problem we choose each day to solve or not. Right, right, each day. Can you say a little more about the call to Unite, about how it's gonna work, like literally what people should do so we start if they're interested? The, there, this will be uh, stream, uh, streamed on uh, basically every streaming platform on YouTube, on Google, on Facebook, on I think Instagram, uh, on, on uh, Twitch. Uh, on many of these streaming platforms and, and on, at our website, which we've just launched called unite.us. And it starts at 8 p.m. Uh, and Oprah will kick it off with some of her uh, most time-honored guests, Eckhart Tolle, and, and others will follow uh, with her. And as she'll be able to interview them and invite their insights and wisdom, Alan Lightman uh, from, uh, from your neck of the woods, uh, Bob will be there, uh, as will T.D. Jakes. So you're starting to see a representation of scientists and people of particular faith traditions and people of more secular uh, contemplative traditions. And we're just gonna go for 24 hours and, uh, and wow. we're gonna feature Dr. Robert Waldinger sharing his most prized uh, tricks, practices and lessons on how to unite. 
at oh. 11 in the evening. And, and that's the- That's right the before only, the party. <laughs> you're the only person I would stay up that late for these days. <laughs> and all your students are gonna be so impressed that you're up at that yeah, hour. <laughs> really, really. But we you know from midnight to 2 a.m., we're gonna have something we're calling the Purpose Party, which is inviting people around the world to dance with a purpose and for a purpose around uniting. And I got on the phone today with the Kung Fu nuns of Kathmandu who are <laughs> teaching people contemplative practices, young women mostly, and also teaching them how to value themselves and protect themselves. And, you know, so it just covers the whole gamut. I mean, Reverend Run and Aloe Black and Alanis Morissette and George W. Bush and, uh, you know, all these Byron Katie and Martha Beck and Julia Roberts. So celebrities, but also moms and dads, nuns on the border, homeless men and women in C on, from the streets of Seattle are going to teach their lessons. It's our chance, mm -hmm. not just to take the master class, but to teach it because cool. everybody has some kind of way they know that works for them to be more centered on being themselves and reaching out to others. Mm. we got to build the toolkit there's not one skill yeah. i mean it'd be nice if i could say hey the book is called x happiness yeah right okay yeah i mean yeah i know you get referred to as the happiness doctor beautiful beautiful <laughs> but there's a lot of ways to happiness no no yeah. but i mean yeah and, uh, yeah and you of course say, so we got we got to get everybody kind yeah. of saying let's opt into being uniters yeah and yeah. see what we produce as this uh in this moment of i hope generosity and service and and shared practices well, I'm thinking about, you know, how powerful these moments are of connection um, th that I, my son is in New York and he takes his iPad out on the balcony at 7 p.m. and play and, and lets us hear all the applause oh, that so happens beautiful. at 7 p.m. and all the bells ringing for the workers That's who are out there yeah. keeping our world going. And, um, you know, and I think what you're doing is you're going to put out there for people on, in so, so many different kinds of people are going to be able to share these ways in which they want to pull us all in and share with us what their passions are and what they mm -hmm. care about. And yeah. I, it just seems to me like the kind of thing that that probably is going to draw us in and, and make us stay up really late. <laughs> and have a good time. Well, the good news is with streaming, I, I shouldn't say this, but with streaming, if you miss Dr. Robert Waldinger at 11 p.m., He'll be up and sitting on the website and you can catch him at 7 a.m. or 10 a.m. or 11, you know, whatever. So, you know, this is in a way we're building a platform that people can, uh, I hope, draw on and I hope uh, contribute to. Again, yeah. have great experts, but some of them are people living on the streets. They're not yeah. all, uh, you know, in Ivy League pr professors. They're not all yeah. in suites. They're not all, uh, you know, in running organizations and things like that. We want to recognize that the wisdom of relationships, the how to reach out and connect is something we all know. And in some ways, the whole goal here is to remind you that you may already know, but maybe you just need to refresh your confidence that you can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you got interested in this. I mean, you have a passion for inclusion and you spent decades you know, Special Olympics is such a rare gift to the world, but people thought you guys were crazy when you started it, right? Yeah. And, and how did you decide, I'm going to devote a huge part of my life yeah. to, to this kind of thing? You could have done a lot of other stuff. Well, you know, I guess I could have, uh, but I had the great fortune of being led by two parents who helped me to see what would give me the most happiness, honestly. Mm. Uh, and it wasn't that a career in this or that or the other thing wasn't right. It's just that this looked like more fun. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes people say to me, oh, you're so nice to have worked in the inner city or that's so good of you to work with people with intellectual or developmental challenges. I'm like, nice. You, you have no idea how much fun I have at work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have yeah. no idea how much my heart gets spun open and soaring every, almost every single day. You have no idea the people I, I mean, I have a front row seat for the best in humanity. That's, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. nobody's in front of me. I'm just, yeah. just, just going to own right now. 
that I hope everybody else has a wonderful career and I hope everybody else has inspiring people to work around. But I feel like uh, selfishly, I have uh, the best seat to see the best of who we are. And so it gives me a lot of confidence. I mean, I'll tell you one story, Bob, you know, so, so I was in this career for a while and, you know, we had a big games and uh, in Dublin in 2003. And part of the games in Dublin with the first time, you know, 135 countries and celebrities, Pierce Brosnan and Bono and Nelson Mandela came to the opening ceremonies and mm. 75,000 people and the whole country ex ex ecstatic. And the sports started. And about the third day, I got a call from the president's office that she wanted to come observe some of the sports. I thought this was terrific. Wow, this is exciting. I said, let's go to the pool. We've got these fantastic swimmers. No, she wants to go to the motor activities. Now, that's our competition for people with severe challenges. People who are often nonverbal, people who often don't have control of their limbs, who are often in wheelchairs. And so I, I kind of embarrassed to say, I said, well, I think she'd prefer to go to the track. We're running the marathon. She'll mm. see the, no, no, mm. you meet her at the uh, motor activities. Mm. So we went in to the motor activities and for some strange reason that is, I, I, I dare say, peculiarly Irish, the place was packed. There was like 1500 fans mm. to watch each person, each contestant do their skill. And the one, the first one that came out is a guy named Donald Page. And his job was to lift the beanbag on his wheelchair tray from the right side to the left side. And his coach wheeled him out and she stood back and the announcer said, off you go. And I'm sitting there in the front row next to the president. And, you know, Donal looks around and uh, you can see he starts to try to move his shoulder and it's nothing's happening. And he can't, he can't. And yeah. I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I feel so terribly for him. Um, at the three minute mark, Bob, he finally got his right hand onto the beanbag and a cheer came out. There you go, <laughs> lad. There you go, mm -hmm. lad. Mm -hmm. And you got 1,500 people. It's quiet. You know, it's almost like a contemplative moment. You know, it's, yeah. but people, if they're not used to that, it's awkward, right? Yeah. And the hand lands and a few cheers come out. And I talked to his dad later and he says, and, you know, I just wanted them to give Donald a bit of time, a bit of time. Over the next 14 minutes, Donald Page slowly lifted that beanbag and put it down at the 17 minute mark. And by this time, the place was, everybody was cheering, standing. It was like the final four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, cheering. yeah, yeah. I was cheering. I have tears yeah. pouring down yeah. my face. Yeah. And I look at this man, 17 years old, any one of us would say, there's no skill in that. There's nothing to be, all he did. And yet I, I thought it was the greatest academic, uh, athletic achievement I'd ever seen. Yeah. And it was just a reminder that when we see each other, when, when we let ourselves out, you know, like he was fearless, right? He got up in front of a thousand, 2000 people just to do the best he could wasn't thinking to himself, I don't look right. He wasn't thinking to himself, I can't stand right. I don't have enough publications. I don't have my hair in the right place, my camera. He just gave himself. Yeah. And I left there both ashamed of the fact that I didn't want to go, mm -hmm. but also it, uh, with, a, with a powerful reminder that in the most unlikely places, uh, we can reach out across the lines. Mm -hmm. Donal, in a sense, reached out to all of us and said, I'm not afraid of me. Don't be afraid of you. Yeah. And, yeah. It, you know, these are the moments that in the Special Olympics movement keep us freshly committed to the idea that it's always best when in doubt, choose to include. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the other thing that strikes me about, I mean, it's such a wonderful story, is that, um, that he showed everybody his best effort and and he was just passionately engaged he was fully committed to yeah. to lifting that That's bag, right. right and to watch that to watch that is riveting right? riveting is absolutely riveting and i think what you 
what you could see when you said this, this was going to be a more fun career is yeah. that you knew that what you wanted was this kind of engagement. Right? That's right. That's I a, wanted that, these, I wanted these moments that Matt, I wanted to be around. I hate to say it. It sounds so, but to be around Donal page, his mom and his dad, he's a dad, dad's a dairy farmer. You know, they, he's, you know, he milks cows. He doesn't, he doesn't have a big factory or anything like that. He milks cows yeah. and delivers milk, raw milk to the dairy. I mean, it, it's just an extraordinary opportunity to connect with people at a very, I think, personal and very uh, affirming level. I mean, this is a family yeah. that could complain about everything, but they're so resilient yeah. Yeah. and so yeah. giving and they're so grateful. I mean, the people in his little village and they all welcomed him back and the police met a motorcade when he returned home. <laughs> and the crowd yeah. the square was filled with people for cheering for Donald, their yeah. champion had come home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. this is when we're together. This is when we overcome. And so, you know, I saw the question, you know, what do we do today about the injustices in our own communities, the, the victimization, if I can put it that way, of people of color and and people with intellectual and the, and the elderly, uh, uh, yeah. you know, in this, in these moments. And I think, We've got to leave this, not just, uh, we like to say, become awake, become connected, and then get motivated, become engaged, become the change, you know? So the, right. it's, we're not about sitting on a cushion, although that's important. We're not just about loving each other, although that's important, but we're mm -hmm. about taking the spirit of centeredness, the power of connection, and then you can't resist. You sh we should all be engaged when this is over in remedying the enormous economic and racial inequalities in our systems and yeah. th those facing the elderly and those yeah. facing people with developmental disabilities. I mean, they're on, uh, they're on the cover of the magazines now. I mean, yeah. we yeah. can't deny it. We see yeah. the numbers. It's, 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 a, it's devastating and it's shocking and it should humiliate and embarrass all of us and motivate us to act. Well, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping from this pandemic is that many of us are gonna start asking this question, okay, what's really important? Right. What, you know, because we go about our lives and we kind of, many of us are on automatic pilot blocks of the day. Yeah. I mean, I find myself on automatic yeah. pilot. Sure. And, and I think because this is so startling, it makes us call everything into question and say, okay, what do I really care about? What's really important? Because I don't have that much energy and I don't have that much time and, and life is short. Yeah. So what matters? And you're talking about stuff that matters deeply. And my hope is that more people are going to realize oh, that I need to step up. It might be in small ways, might be in large ways, uh, you know, and, and kind of what you were saying about just making it a bit better. So we don't, we don't have to make it all better. There's no way we're going to make Right. any of this all better yeah. but to say i'm going to do something yeah uh, i th i think uh, i think if i uh, maybe if i can be bold here i'm going to say that if we can each do something to end the divisiveness in our culture yeah. however small not to step back from what you believe strongly not to step back from positions political or otherwise uh, that you believe deeply in your soul, but maybe to take a step back from contempt, as Arthur Brooks writes. Uh, maybe in the, in the easing of contempt and the increase in loving kindness or in open heartedness or in love, I dare say, maybe we don't necessarily shrink from what is most important to us, but we find a new way to communicate it. Because if we communicate so much with so much contempt and anger and hostility, right. I, I, I mean, I think we've seen what that gets us. It gets us anger and contempt and hostility. And we can say, but we're right. You know, this is what everybody thinks. We've done polling on this. Yeah, Both right. sides of all these polar, polar opposites, they think they're right. Now, I'm not saying one isn't or one is, but I'm just saying, if we dig in over and over again to contempt, we pretty much guarantee the other side's not gonna agree with us. That's and then right. we pretty much guarantee that we're not gonna get anything done. Yep. So it's a hard thing actually, I've found in talking to people, Bob, to actually say to folks, if the number one problem is division, then the first problem we have to solve is divisiveness and contempt and 
and, and, and stigmatizing other people. And then we can get to the political problems and people go, wait a minute, but we've got to get rid of this. That's the first problem we have to solve. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote your conscience and I'm not saying you shouldn't engage politically, but if no matter what happens in the next election, whether it's in Massachusetts or the United States or France or Germany or anywhere else for that matter, no matter what happens in the next election, there's gonna be another one coming and another one coming and another one coming. And the hope we all have to have is that we won't be just boxing from one election to another as we split each other apart, increase anxiety and despair and destroy our planet while we're at it. Right, right. You know, in, in Zen, we have a, a saying, a phrase, the mind of right and wrong. Mm. The idea that when we get into that mindset That's of right. there are good guys and bad guys, there's the yeah. right way and the wrong way, that it is so limiting, that it boxes us in so severely that most possibilities are shut off. And I think that's what you're talking about, yeah. that, that we all can go there. It's so yeah. easy to, yeah. to push me into the mind of right and wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I've shut down. Yeah. And, that's and what it, you seeing. rarely find yourself pushed into the mind of right and wrong thinking you're wrong. <laughs> no, exactly. Oh, I'm so right. Because the, right, the mind of right and wrong is usually I'm right, they're wrong. <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Now, of course, there's self-doubt and I know there's shame, which is I'm wrong. I don't get me wrong. I know these are complex emotional challenges, but um, it's it. You're, I agree with you that the, the Zen teachers have a lot to to help us understand how to get out of that mind without losing a focus on love and belonging and joy and justice. Really, these are important things. Right. It's not like we shouldn't care about them. It's just how like. If we want love and justice and belonging, maybe, as Dr. King said, maybe we get there by doing love and justice. And yeah. Love. Yeah. Right? Maybe it's not like we fight our way or kill our way to the goal of love, but maybe we love our way to the goal right. of love. It sounds right. a little, a little crazy and soft, and maybe, um, maybe not edgy enough for a tough academic minded uh, audience or world. But I, I think uh, I was reading about Dr. King, you know, his, his interest in nonviolence centered on the idea that he thought it was the most powerful tool ever imagined for achieving social justice, not mm -hmm. because he was trying to be a nice guy, but because he saw in it the means to finally attack and decisively defeat injustice wherever its head arose. So it's a very practical minded thing to get out of the mind of right and wrong. Right. Into the mind of, uh, if I, I'm not sure how the Zen language, into the non-binary or into the open mind, into the welcoming mind, so that not so that we don't solve the problem, so that we actually can heal the problem right. Where, right. where it rests. Right. I mean, one of the things I'd love to hear about, you know, you, you, you make this case so powerfully that inclusion is our only hope going right. forward. And, but what, what could inclusion look like on a national scale? What, do, do you have any, uh, it's a, I know it's a big question, yeah. but, but what might it look like if we get beyond these, these political systems yeah. that we're embedded in? What would it look well, like? Well, you know, people, I, I was on a call the other day uh, about this uniter's identity. And uh, someone said, well, I think you should be saying people should vote as uniters. Hadn't occurred to me that there's a uniter party, that there's no. a uniter pledge, that there's a uniter uh, bill of rights, or that there's a uniter uh, uh, you know, platform. Why? Because everything on the platforms now are things that Democrats think they want that Republicans don't want and Republicans platform is the exact opposite, right? Yeah. And if you actually put something on the platform that everybody agrees on, nobody cares. So all the uniting ideas go nowhere mm. because nobody funds them. Nobody gets angry right. about them. Nobody votes. I, I mean, this is on us. We don't vote for uniters. We vote for polarizers. Right. That's so exactly maybe right. it's a political context in which we can create a little bit of momentum around a different political framing uh, with the, you know, the integral consciousness people call, you know, turquoise or integral, con maybe there's an integral politics. Uh, we certainly can see the foundation of a different kind of education where we educate both head and heart. 
in very open-minded and very, very uh, grounded and very uh, concrete and effective ways, we can see that teaching empathy, uh, teaching resilience, teaching forgiveness, teaching gratitude, these things help children learn. Mm -hmm. uh, teaching self-awareness, teaching feelings identification, children learn better. So we can see the beginnings of shifts in schools already with the social and emotional learning work towards a place in which we actually reach across divides and kids and young people and teachers are trained to do so. And I think this could happen in other uh, areas as well. I think we could see very exciting new developments in criminal justice. We could see very exciting new developments uh, in the environment. Uh, the environment should, I mean, come on, the environment should not be a source of division. I mean, no. Who doesn't love the earth? Who doesn't love nature? Yeah. Who doesn't yeah. love, you know, bre breathing? <laughs> I mean, yeah. So we, we've gotten stuck in things where I, I can't admit to this because it would concede something to your team. Mm -hmm. So we've got to start to unlock some of that. It's, it's going to take time. These are, this is, a, I, I would argue, almost an era-defining shift we're in the middle of. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of pushback to anger and division. And uh, sometimes that makes us feel good. Don't get me wrong. I get that. But I would see there's a potential flourishing of new ideas and creativity if we think more as uniters and includers uh, and marshal that kind of thinking and practice. I mean, we got to yeah. practice. This is not something you think and then you get it. <laughs> no. It's an That's everyday it. kind of thing. I mean, you know, Bob, you, I don't know if you've ever on these calls shared your practice, says your personal practices, but I think these are important for people to know because you don't just wake up in the morning and know it all, right? You wake up, oh. my guess is in the morning <laughs> to practice, right? Oh my gosh, every day. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. What's your, so what's your practice? What can, have you, are you comfortable sharing? Uh, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I meditate every day. I uh -huh. sit down on my cushion. I, well, I light incense. I bow to my cushion. I sit uh -huh. down. I will often read something just to get me into a, a little bit of, a little piece of Zen wisdom and uh -huh. that gets me into a frame of mind. And then I will sit in silent meditation for 25 minutes. Nice. Um, do you do that at the same time every morning? I used to do it at the same time when my kids were young. And, and so I had to do it before anybody woke up in the house right. because otherwise it was all over. Right. And now I sometimes do it in the morning and sometimes do it late in the Amazing. afternoon. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And you've but been I, doing that for uh re religiously if you will for uh 15 years but uh, earlier as well but yeah. certainly for 15 years every day yeah beautiful um and i think you know if, thank you for asking that because you know it can look like there are these people who have it figured out and that is so not right, the case right, right. it's certainly so not me right yeah and it's so i've never met anybody any spiritual teacher or evolved person who, who i respect who will claim they've got it figured out. Yeah. And uh, because we don't, because as you say, we're trying, we're, we're right. practicing, right. we're trying to get it right. And that's we it. never get it right. And that's right. okay. Yeah. As long as we're trying. I think, you know, I, I think that that language that, you know, you have in medicine, you practice medicine. You, you, don't, you don't learn and then do medicine. Right. You practice, you practice the law. Uh, you know, you practice your faith if you come from a faith tradition. I think we kind of a little bit in the spiritual world have, at least in the more traditional religions, we kind of thought, well, you just say the words and you got it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you should do something, you know, you should celebrate Sabbath or you yeah. should celebrate Sunday or you should celebrate, but they're more sort of check the box things. You're not actually deepening and practicing. Yeah. And most people, I mean, I grew up in the, in the Catholic tradition, most people, yes, you know, in my, my parents' generation, you know, they would have ritualized prayers that they would do daily and special months and special saints and devotions. But, you know, we thought that was all kind of, oh my goodness, it's so kind of uh, uh, old fashioned and, you know, uh, magical thinking and stuff like that. But, you know, there were practices that actually probably deepened presence and cultivated an inner openness and helped constantly daily remind you of your vulnerability or your need for trust or whatever the whatever the, the big lessons were of the various traditions and i think we got to get back to practicing 
maybe yeah. if I can say they're practicing being Americans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's what, you know, I find that my meditation practice really makes me look at my humanness in all of its kind of wonderfulness and ugliness. <laughs> yeah, and, know. You know, all my pettiness, <laughs> all my petty thoughts come up when I sit on my cushion yeah. in the morning, right? And it's like, oh yeah, there they are again. There they are yeah, again. <laughs> that's me. And, and that I think what we're talking about is, is sharing our humanity with each other in these bigger ways, in these more public ways, you know, your Unite Us uh, adventure yeah. is trying to do that, is trying to say, look, let's just share what it's like to be a human being yeah. in the world. And yeah. we're going to find that there's so much connecting us. Yeah. And, and that's what I find that these, that if I sit still with myself, that's the start. And then when I, I mean, hanging out with you right now is, uh, is a way it, for me is very nourishing because it's like, Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sharing certain things that we, that we have in common that reminds me of this humanness that's kind of essential to, um, to, to, to being together in the world and getting through the hard times that are inevitable. So this pandemic is one hard time. Yeah. Having a child with a disability is a hard time. We right. need each other no matter what the, no matter what the challenges are. That's right. Um, it's, uh, you know, my, one of my mentors that, just died a, a couple of years ago, Thomas Keating, who for many years was at a monastery in Massachusetts and then out in Colorado. I asked him about four or five years ago, why don't you push uh, in the language in, in his tradition is called centering prayer, but it's very much like a contemplative practice, not wildly dissimilar from those in other traditions. There's some differences, but, and he said, oh, don't you know, uh, almost everybody that starts quits. Yes. <laughs> And I said, no, 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 that's not true. It's the, just, he says, you just remember how many horrible things come up during, <laughs> during, yeah. during yes. those sits. Most yes. people don't want to live with that side. They, <laughs> they'd rather not face, you know. So, but he, I think it's one of the great gifts of your practice and the practices that have been taught by people like you is that it teaches us it's okay. Oh, yeah. That ego game you play. And you saw it again, mm-hmm. and you did it again. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. And you don't hold on to the fear that I got to hide it, and you don't stick it back to yourself and saying I got to judge it. You just accept at some level who you are, and in yeah. doing so, allow a little space between all that distraction and your true self, just a teeny bit of space. And in those moments, and, and, you know, so we teach these things, you know, we teach mindfulness and, and different kinds of silent practices to children in f- kindergarten, first grade. And, you know, when we started doing this, people said, oh, you can't, you know, children can't sit still for a minute, much less for 10 minutes. Kids love. They it. love it. They love it. It's a natural language. As my, again, Thomas Keating said, to me, it is the first language is silence. And we, we're, we're conditioned to be afraid of it. Why, wait a minute. You know, and whenever I go on a retreat, people say, oh, how long were you quiet? I was like, you know, a week. Oh my. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, a week. Yeah. You must be kidding. I couldn't be quiet for 20 minutes. And um, I think it's just, be, we just have to remember, you know, all these, I mean, I was introduced to that world by friends mm-hmm. who said, you should try this. I think maybe part of this moment is to say, if you don't have a practice, uh, of some sort that allows you to center and draw inward and awaken, depending on what, you, what language you, you like from your point of view. Um, if you don't have such a practice, I think one of the great encouragements of this moment is to encourage more and more of us to develop uh, one or more for that matter. Yes, absolutely. And then I think, you know, my experience has been that I can take what I learn about myself in my practice. And then when I meet other people who are willing to share it as well. It's like such a relief because, you know, I, one of my Zen teachers was fond of saying, we're always comparing our insides to other people's outsides. Right. Yeah. And, you know, because we all like put on our game faces for yeah. each other, right? And so, so first of all, I get to know my inside much better. And some of that's kind of embarrassing, you know, yeah. but like, okay, I'm beginning to accept more and more of this me. And then, 
when I share it with other people, and I think when we share across these divides, we realize this is us, right? Yeah. Well, and, and also it's kind of like, well, that person, I can see that person's playing a big ego game. That's the same one I play. I play, exactly. <laughs> so instead exactly. of trying to, you know, uh, run out of the room and say, what a jerk, uh, you know, one of the questions here, uh, two of the questions I saw, one on, on issues of inequality and race and the other on individualism versus, uh, versus community from yeah. my great colleague, Lamont um, uh, Young. I, I think, you know, this is one of those things where we we tilted the scales way towards individualism. Yeah. And even, you know, my practice, which is not dissimilar from yours, it's quite individual. You've got your cushion. I've got mine. Right. We sit, you sit, I sit. You know, it's all drawing inward. But we need to remember that all these practices came to us from a community. And they're sustained by community. And they're designed to bring us in the community. So... I like to say, you know, a, a spiritual practice without a social connection or a social change strategy is might have taken a detour towards narcissism and might need to get back on track because yeah. um, I, I think any deep spiritual commitment or mental health commitment to one's own health, almost invariably, if it's authentic, I hope draws us into deeper connection and deeper solidarity with each other. So it's sure. Yeah individualism yeah. and community they should be i think uh hand in glove it would be my hope it's certainly my experience well that's been and and the teaching that i received in this was that sitting and meditating you know having a contemplative practice that's really great but that's the easy part so that's like going to a batting cage and doing batting practice where everything is just like teed up for you precisely that the real challenge is to go out and play the game of life, right? Is to leave the batting cage and to really take this practice into the world every yeah, day. Absolutely. And that's what you're talking about. So to be engaged in the world rather than just contemplating our navels, which that's we it. don't want to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Now, one of the things you'll be interested in, so we asked people a couple of questions during, while we've been talking. So one was, what's your biggest concern right now? And again, family is still far and away the biggest concern. So mm -hmm. people are really focused on family concerns. But the other thing is we asked, what's, what do you see as the greatest source of division right now in your life? And they said national politics. Mm. So people are certainly echoing what you yeah. are speaking to and what you're now putting so much effort into. Yeah, I hope... You know, these are kind of tricky things to say. And this is where I'm going to trust our audience that if I don't say it exactly right, um, you know, a lot of people don't try to say what I'm about to say because they're afraid they're going to get caught saying the wrong thing. <laughs> and that's just an example of our bad national culture. Um, uh, I think we have to give everybody a little bit of a pass like let's play a little less gotcha on both sides. Yeah. Now, someone might say, how can you say that when X or Y or Z has done something so outrageous and so condemnable and so malicious and so narcissistic or so abusive? Um, I think we consume versions of each other that make everybody as bad as they can be. Now, I agree, some of us give a lot of uh, ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I don't think we win by getting the other person and trying to humiliate them. I mean, humiliated people, this is a lesson I've talked with uh, my, my friend, Tom Friedman about this when he looks at global relationships, the columnist in the New York Times. Yeah. Humiliated people end up doing horrible things. Mm -hmm. It's just a lesson of history. Yeah. You may defeat them, uh, you may uh, disagree with them, but it, once they feel humiliated, uh, it never ends up in a good place. Yeah. The truth is there's a lot of Americans on both sides who feel humiliated, not necessarily just by who they are or where they're living, but how they're treated. Yep. So if we just took that as our marker and maybe just took a step back right now, I mean, right now, what do we need? We need each other. If you ask the mm -hmm. nurses, I was talking to nurses earlier, what do they need? They, nobody mentioned the governor or the president or 
Dr. Fauci or Dr. Birx, they said, we just need people to be safe so we don't lose our lives. Yeah. That's, now you can say, but my governor didn't say that, or this governor is doing, okay, I'm not saying it's not true, but let's not, I, I just think we'd be better off if we didn't try to humiliate the governor or the president or the official we didn't try to humiliate the other person and actually wished the best for them, mm. as hard as that may be, then maybe we'd get to the kinds of solutions that would save the lives of nurses. And we might not feel as self-righteous about being angry about things that deserve our anger, but maybe we'd get to the solutions more quickly. Yeah, I mean, I hope that doesn't sound like, yeah. I would say false equivalents and things like that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be the person who says all answers are correct, but I do believe uh, that um, reducing humiliation for all these people would be, a, a, even the people we disagree with would be a good step coming out of this crisis. Yeah, yeah. You know, so just as you were saying that, Todd, our wonderful yeah. friend and supporter yeah. put up the results of the question we asked mm -hmm. just now, which was where, it, where do you want to heal divisions? Where's the place you think we can heal divisions? And the majority of people said person to person. Yeah. They, yeah. they didn't answer national politics. They didn't even answer local politics, person to person. And but that's you know why that's so important. That's so important, Bob, is because we did this poll and we, I think the number, I'm not going to get the number exactly right. I think it was almost a quarter of Americans reported having lost a friendship or a family relationship yeah. in the last three years. Yeah. So when people say person to person, what I, part of what they might be saying is there's a lot of stress in my house, uh, which completely understandable. But part of what they may be saying is, you know, I, I can't stand, I, I've lost my connection to my sister or my cousin or my mm. uncle. Mm. Uh, and the second one is national discussions. And we, we, we've seen this, our national politics is making us not just stuck, but it's also making us sick. And we've, you can't just wait for the other side to fix it. That's right. <laughs> the other side won't, can't fix it. We each have to fix it. We each have to take a chance on reducing the humiliation uh, that we dish out in order to discover and recover the dignity that we seek in ourselves and in others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the, you know, uh, um, the Dalai Lama said, my religion is kindness. Yeah. And if we, if, if, if our default response is kindness, <laughs> whenever we're yeah. challenged, yeah. that goes on, that's a, that's a that's a pretty good place to start. It's a pretty good place to start. And a friend of mine said the other day, but you know, all of his progressive friends believe in inclusion, but he had come to realize in the last year that they actually believed in inclusion for people that think like them. Yes, exactly. So we progressives, I'm guessing much of your audience is leans towards the progressive side of things. We have to practice kindness, not just to people who agree with us. Absolutely, absolutely. Not just to people who agree with us. Right, right. Uh, and that's the work. That's, that's the, the real. There, there's there, and there there's is the work. The work. Yeah. There's the work. Well, listen. Um, this is wonderful. I could, I could do this. Yeah, we could keep <laughs> going. I know. We could keep going, but and we such, will, and we will keep going. We will on Friday night. <laughs> on Friday night. But thank you so much for. Thank you for uh, including me, and thanks for, for this great conversation, and thanks for holding this yeah. space for all of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm really excited about about what you are about to yeah unite.us come to the website yeah. help us socialize it bring your friends if you're if you're looking for strategies if you're looking for healing if you're looking for solutions if you're looking for hope uh, if you're looking for people to feel like uh, you're seen and to be and to know that you're not alone join us on this extraordinary uh call uh and uh join us in uh trying to build a more united future unite.us yes this friday great Thank you. Thank Looking you. forward to it. All right. So I'm just going to give a few reminders as we sign off. First of all, thank you all for tuning in. Um, remember, you can come back to this YouTube channel and, and see a recording of this whenever you want to. Uh, connect with us on Twitter. I'd love to hear more thoughts and reactions to my conversation with Tim. And you can go to our uh, foundation website, lifespanresearch.org, where we have blog posts and, and where we try to put out some of these ideas, which are so important right now, more than ever. 
Um, so, so everybody stay safe and thank you and see you again very soon. Bye.